Welcome to the uh, our latest edition of the Leaders in Housing Counseling call. Glad to have you all on. Looks like we're going to have a very strong turnout today. Obviously, we're talking about things that are deeply important to all of us. Um, Ellie, I'm not seeing the screen uh, pop up. Is that is everything working okay? Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, well, we'll keep working on that. Oh, here we go. All right. Oh, there, there we go. go. No. Okay, we're well, back <laughs> in. So, still welcome. Glad to have you all here. Can you believe it's already July? Amazing. So, a lot to do, and um, we have a lot uh, that's going to, um, uh, that's coming forward in the housing counseling world. Um, we're only going to touch on parts of it today, but um, we'll continue throughout the year to really um, start addressing lots of the issues that are most pertinent to everybody. And please tell us if there are things you, um, um, emerging issues that you feel like we should be jumping on. Um, let's jump over to the agenda really quickly just to review what we're going to do today. So um, Latika is going to walk us through a little bit of what's happening in Congress. Um, we're going to have some NHRC updates including um, um, Ellie's going to do just a quick talk on uh, the work we're doing with prioritizing first-time home buyers and trying to um, not have cash buyers and um, investors dominate the market, trying to get your people to be able to be homeowners again. Um, uh, and I'll touch on a few things, uh, initiatives that just that we've been following that you know about. Um, but most of the call will be devoted to the uh, COVID-19 servicing updates. I'm really pleased that we've got the National Consumer Law Center, the USDA, um, Veterans so, um, and Affairs, and the CFPB all here to talk about um, the latest updates. So it'll be helpful to all your clients. Um, and so we'll spend the bulk of a call talking about that. With that quick note, um, let's transfer over to uh, um, to Latika. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. As you know, the president has pushed forward uh, the FY22 budget to $65.9 uh, million for HUD housing counseling. But here at the National Housing Resource Center, we are doing what we need to do to push for $100 million for next year's budget to make sure that all of the nonprofits across the country have enough financial resources to do what they do every day, the amazing work that they do to push forward housing in multiple different ways. Um, next week, we have meetings with Senator Sinema in Arizona and Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. They are important voices when it comes to housing and what it means for the infrastructure bill, which Democrats are racing to push uh, and will be pushing for, it looks like on July 19th. The infrastructure bill is important and it is a key to the reconciliation process that happens in the Senate. So we'll be talking to them about the importance of housing and making sure that they understanding understand that housing is infrastructure. Thank you so much. Good. Um, so, and, and obviously you've been reading about the infrastructure bill in, in, um, uh, in, in the Congress and the newspaper. Um, we are really trying to build that the home ownership components be a part of that, but also making sure that some of the um, not not so easy votes uh, in the, especially in the Senate, will be um, um, supportive as well. And so we're working with groups. Um, Latika has been working with groups in West Virginia and in um, Arizona to um, um, so that we'll be able to have some conversations with those senators specifically. Um, there's plenty more we're going to be doing, but uh, uh, this upcoming week, these I think are the most crucial conversations. So very helpful there. So um, uh, Ellie, did you want to talk about the um, uh, about the work being done on the first time home buyer? Sure. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry, everybody. I'm having a little technical difficulty here today. Let's see. I want to show my share my camera. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, yeah. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, our work with prioritizing first-time home buyers. 
we had a series of small working group meetings, which I mentioned um, on a previous call. And the other day we had another call, we kind of reconvened the larger group and had another call just to talk about where, where do we go from here. Some of the things that we got that we talked about that we'll be kind of fleshing out a little bit more are, uh, is there a way to use some form of a, a tax hit to disincentivize investors? Uh, and so if anybody on this call knows somebody who's a tax expert that we could um, that we could talk with, uh, that would be really helpful. Just email me, epepper at hsgcenter.org or Bruce B. Dorp Halen uh, at hsgcenter.org. Um, we also talked about the, the fact that nonprofits really need capital in order to be able to really compete with cash buyers. There were there was a CDFI on the call that was talking about how they are working to really figure out how to be a cash buyer on behalf of a of, a, of one of, of one of their first time home buyers in their programs, and then uh, the 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 home buyer would then be able to get their mortgage and so on and purchase the home from the nonprofit. Um, but also having extra cash available for larger down payment assistance amounts. That was one of the things that came up that um, larger down payments are needed. Um, also talking about uh, exploring state level options for different codes and so on. There are some code uh, uh, examples that are out of Denver, uh, Colorado, out of California and out of New York City. So talking about how to how to do that um, in more states. And then uh, finally, we talked about supporting HR 816, Restoring Communities Left Behind Act, which is um, right now um, and is getting a lot of behind the scenes support and we hope we'll move forward. Um, it, it, the other thing that uh, I wanna mention, there's a link here to a survey um, if you are working with home buyers where you're seeing this happen to them, that they're getting kind of pushed out by cash buyers and and or and um, investors in the market who are, uh, you know, offering more and offering cash, um, we really want to hear about it. And particularly, we want to hear about if you have some sort of uh, if you've been seeing or hearing that. Uh, buyers are being told that they, if they have an FHA, VA, or USDA mortgage, or if they have down payment assistance, that they shouldn't bother with making an offer on a specific property that they're interested in. Um, we're interested in hearing about that, and particularly if you have some kind of proof. If there's something in an MLS listing about it, or an email, or you know something somewhere that shows that this is that this is happening, not just a verbal thing with the real estate agent. We'd like that kind of proof. Um, that would help us with trying to deal with this because it is um, possibly um, could be considered steering, which is obviously prohibited. And that's it for me. Back to you, Bruce. Okay, good. Um, and you covered the housing assistance fund. Okay, okay, good. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, that's that's right. So there isn't any. There's no new updates about the housing assistance fund, other than the fact that states now have until July 31st to submit their plans. It was June. 30th and Treasury did extend to July 31st, but no new guidance has been put out yet. So states are still waiting on that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so this week, the um, uh, probably next week or next week or two, um, there'll be a new um, uh, there'll be legislation, Housing Infrastructure Act of 2020. Housing is Infrastructure um, Act of 2021. Uh, Chairwoman uh, Maxine Waters in the House will be introducing it. it. It covers a lot of ground, and it may be as a separate bill, down payment towards equity. That's the down payment first generation, first time home buyer program that provides up to $20,000 grants and for socially and economically disadvantaged, an extra $5,000 in grants. Both of those are um, introduced, uh, they, they should be introduced uh, the next week or two, um, along with the, the housing voucher legislation ending homelessness. Um, we've been, as you know, deeply involved with the conversations around the DPA, um, the, the first gen uh, program. And, uh, you know, it's it's pretty interesting. They're, they're, it's evolving as it's going along. 
There were a lot of concerns about whether housing counseling agencies would have the capacity to meet the demand for this, along with all the other things that groups are juggling with. So they, what they said was that in marketplaces where um, it's a, it takes more than 30 days to get to a counseling agency, where there's a real backup, that they'll need to go through uh, one of the nonprofit online services to get uh, um, to use that as as the equivalent of counseling. And I know it's not the same, but it is. It was a compromise that ended up uh, in the legislation. Um, we're also trying to get in the legislation that the down payment assistance is only available if people do the counseling before they've signed a sales agreement and signed a, um, a home buyer uh, or, or signed a mortgage application. So all those things we think strengthen the bill, but it's got a lot of very good, important things. The loans are stackable. They will be. Um, um, they will really work on targeting, especially black and brown um, home buyers. All of this, we think, is is an important part of this, and hopefully, um, and I think the big push right now, the reasons coming out, is the idea that it might be included in the the big um, infrastructure conversations. I think the way it's shaping up, as I'm sure you all have been seeing in the paper, is that the House, um, that, I'm sorry, that the White House um, is negotiating with a bipartisan group of moderates. And that deal is the traditional infrastructure. It means that there's um, that they won't that housing, as we understand it, is not included in that bill, um, and that the rest that we would like to see included would be through the reconciliation process, which is a lot harder for us to get through. Um, uh, it's it, it's under a set of rules in the Senate about things that have to do directly with the budget, and there's a parliamentarian who decides what gets in and what doesn't, and um, uh, it sometimes limits the flexibility of what you can put in that might be guidance for, for um, um, uh, people implementing the programs. So lots of those things are very important. We're going to see what happens, but um, we're um, heartened that a lot of very powerful people in, in the House and Senate um, are very interested in getting a down payment proposal in, and that first generation is the seems to be the one that, that's that's gaining the most attention right now. We'll keep you informed on that. Um, there may be some point where it's a lobby moment, um, but uh, it isn't right now exactly, um, except to the extent that if you if you're talking with your House or Senate people, it's worth saying that. Um, housing is infrastructure will matter for where you are and that we really need much deeper investment to improve people's lives in, in their own district. Um, the Black Homeownership Collaborative is, um, did a rollout um, a couple of weeks ago in Cleveland and uh, to kind of announce the program. They're now shifting into their next phase, which is to um, try to implement more, more things, down payment assistance, um, I think was the first one out of the, the trap. We, we, we'd like to stay involved, especially on down payment assistance and on housing counseling, but also be into some involvement with marketing and, and outreach, which we think is pretty important um, in the long-term uh, piece of all this. So we'll, we'll keep you informed of as, as that develops. Um, uh, we're, we're hopeful that this broad industry coalition that covers both the financial services industry and housing organizations will have some legs and, and have the ability to help move pieces forward. And it certainly seems to have had a, a helpful role in, in dealing with industry. Um, the one other area that we're really paying a lot of attention to right now is the Section 8 home ownership vouchers. So most of you are I'm sure are familiar with rental vouchers, and there's an equivalent home ownership component. It's voluntary for the PHA, the um, housing authority, and um, uh, not every housing authority does it, and many of the ones that do do it only do a few properties in a year, but some have really brought it up to scale. And what is what the advantage is, is that it, in the same way as a Section 8 voucher on rental, it pays for the portion of people's mortgage payments that are above, um, uh, I think it's you know, 30 or 31 percent of their uh, um, household income. And 
Um, it is a vehicle for very low income people to become homeowners. Um, there's a number of things we, we're trying to figure out about what needs to be done to improve the program so that it's used more broadly. But this is a piece of the puzzle in terms of figuring out black home ownership in this country and the home ownership gap. And, uh, this, uh, and it's a very good vehicle to solve some very particular problems, especially on the lower income spectrum. So um, we're looking for people who are working in this now. We know some of you are working with your local housing authorities on this. And we want to really understand what works well in the programs and what doesn't. So we talked with a few of you about this, but we do need to hear from more. So please email me. Um, we're very interested in, in what you're learning in the field and would love to incorporate you in these discussions because we're, I mean, there's two major voucher bills right now that are only focused on rental. And we've talked with the staffs. There is interest in including something on home ownership if we can put together the right mix of what needs to be done but we don't know what that is yet. So we're trying to figure it out. We could use your help. We also think that uh, we have a very um, interested ear at HUD on this as well. And we think that that'll be an opportunity as well. So lots of important things to happen to come forward. Uh, as always, we really appreciate your help. Well, that we're gonna move on to our, our next area, which is to really talk about, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Ellie. Um, so to talk about the various um, forbearance and servicing issues. So before we before we do move on, Bruce, there are a couple of comments and questions about the Section 8 home ownership that I thought might be interesting to address right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, one person says with Section 8 home ownership, it would require an enormous increase in investment. Our community does not have nearly enough Section 8 to support renters, and that is then hard to pivot towards home ownership. Curious what your thoughts are on that. You know, this is exactly one of the critical um, policy issues here. Um, we don't want to starve rental. It's um, only a quarter of the people who could qualify for Section 8 rental get it today, and it's definitely a driving force in poverty in the United States. Um, the, the, why we're looking at it right now is this idea that there's a, there are vehicles to drastically increase the availability of Section 8 vouchers. And while we don't want to uh, take away from the rental side, the idea, I think my idea of this, and we're open to what others think, is that, it, that the home ownership program, who's the same population, should be able to grow proportionately with, with the pot. So under Chairwoman uh, Waters' proposal, they're really moving towards universal vouchers. So there will be available, if, if that comes into fruition over a 10 year period of time, then you know that issue is no longer there. The other one is, uh, um, uh, is aimed at uh, a set aside of like 500,000 vouchers for uh, families with children. Um, and you know that's also an expansion of the program. Um, and again, the same um, population. So thinking that might be some, some of that might get included in it as well. And, and again, it's always gonna be a local decision about what the, um, uh, what the localities of the PHAs decide to do. But it's a very good concern. What was the other one? Uh, well, the other one was what you just mentioned was um, moving to universal vouchers seems like uh, one of the only options to address it. Yeah, well said. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Uh, so we will move on now to the uh, main portion of our of our presentation today. We're going to start with Steve Sharp, who's staff attorney at National Consumer Law Centers. Steve's been here on our on our leaders and housing counseling calls several times. He's always got a lot of really great information for us, and he's going to talk today about some of the updates to the um, COVID-19 uh, loss mitigation for for FHA, FHFA, and some updates to the FlexMod. So, Steve, take great. it away. Well, thanks everyone and uh, appreciate it. Always appreciate uh, joining you all, uh, especially uh, in the aftermath of an incredibly busy month. June was wild. We had 
uh, COVID updates uh, a couple of every week, it seems, and so there's a lot to catch up on. I am absolutely honored to be on here, with, not only with you all, but also with folks from the VA, USDA, and CFPB. Uh, really a testament to uh, how important uh, servicing issues are, and I'm glad, just glad that uh, you all, we have such a good turnout here, and that I could share uh, the webinar with uh, our, our uh, you know, stakeholders and uh, friends in the government. So. Um, I am going to do what I usually do and start with an overview, uh, especially because there's so many different moving pieces going on. And then um, I'm going to fill in the gaps with FHA and FHFA, Fannie Freddie, and then of course um, the other folks can uh, pick up on their respective uh, uh, organizations and uh, parts of the government. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for your work. Um, just to remind you how important you all are in improving federal policy. I haven't been on since uh, we got the clarification, oh, two months ago from HUD about when borrowers can choose to end forbearance and be um, evaluated for uh, post forbearance options. Since that came out in May, uh, which was the stickiness of forbearance problem. Um, where uh, HUD, uh, some HUD servicers were not allowing people to um, leave forbearance early to access LOFMIT options. Uh, you all uh, in the field saw that problem, saw that that was not okay under the policy and uh, through Ellie and, and, and some folks at Legal Aid raising the same issues. Uh, we got clarification from HUD uh, on that point. Um, I believe Ellie has shared that um, I can share it with you again. Again, it's just a reminder that people can leave forbearance early um, to get, to be evaluated. But really, that came from folks in housing counseling offices across the country saying that this was a problem. Um, and we got quick clarification from HUD on that. So uh, just a reminder that uh, please share problems when if things are not running as they should. You all have an important voice and can get some policy clarifications when when needed. So thank you all. And uh, let's keep working on that. Let's keep working together on that, um, those sort of issues to make sure everything's working for folks. Um, so in the overview, a reminder that essentially uh, in COVID, we've sort of had three buckets of policy updates um, when we look uh, at what's available for folks. We have more foreclosure moratoria or pauses on um, from an investor on proceeding forward with foreclosure cases. So that is about our, our, our foreclosure sale actions. Um, so that has been uh, happening on a investor by investor level. Um, of course, the CFPB rule kind of um, changes that a little bit. And we're gonna let the CFPB talk about that. But generally we've had the moratorium, we've had so which is a broad investor uh, stop on foreclosure actions. We've had forbearance options, which are borrowers seeking a temporary break on their mortgage payments due to a COVID hardship, but then recognizing that those borrowers have to pay their money back eventually. So then we have the third bucket, which are post forbearance options, options to bring the loans current once the borrower is ready to do so. And so, um, we have had updates in every one of those boxes coming up uh, in, in the month of June for investors. And so keeping track of them is a, is a little challenging. Uh, I, I would start from the White House announcement. I think that is sort of the main, uh, main stage setting. So on June 24th, the White House uh, in the um, looking at expiring uh, moratoria and expiring options for forbearance, um, had a statement saying, okay, we're going to um, extend for uh, VA, USDA, and FHA insured loans, the moratorium on foreclosures to July 31st. So that's the current policy that we have, moratoria on foreclosure actions until July 31st. Um, and so the FHFA, who uh, regulates Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, does not have to uh, follow the White House. They are an independent agency. They did not do not have to follow uh, what the White House says, but they in fact followed suit and also uh, extended the moratorium to July 31st. So right now we have 
VA, USDA, FHFA, or FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, continued foreclosure moratorium July 31st. Um, I think there was some indication in some of these announcements, at least from FHA, I believe that this is the last one. Um, who knows, of course, but you know, I would, I'm not sure that we're going to have more than that. Um, and again, moratoriums leave out the private insurance, the private market, the, um, the private label securities and the portfolio loans that are not governed by those investors that I listed. But of course, the CFPB rule, which we'll talk about later, just keep a little pin in that because we do have the CFPB rule uh, coming later. The other thing the White House said is that borrowers uh, with, uh, in, with those government insured programs are able to start forbearance plans um, by uh, starting on September 30th, 2021. So there's a really, there's still sort of legal question about the back and forth of where the CARES Act comes into play and when borrowers can start forbearance. So we have though, um, at least for the FHA, VA, and USDA, we're starting for borrowers can still say, I've got a COVID hardship, I need to start a forbearance plan um, through at least September 30th for those folks. FHFA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac does not have a uh, cutoff date for where you can start because they have a standard forbearance tool in their toolkit. Um, they're just looking at this as uh, you can access forbearance generally. Um, if you if if you need it, um, so there's no uh, end date there. Um, now that is um, not these 18 months of forbearance. I don't uh, is, although FHA had a what we we can get into like extended forbearance or not. That that's not what we talked about in the White House announcement. The White House announcement was just okay. We're gonna move this from June 30th to September 30th. You can start forbearance. So your punchline, your clients, if they come in with a COVID hardship and people are still going to have those, we're still in the aftermath of this pandemic, um, they can start initial forbearance plans um, for the three uh, government programs and then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, at least until September 30th, with the caveat that of course, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, even after um, should, should be fine there. Again, we're leaving out the private uh, folks, that's the third of the market, that's the private, um, privately, uh, you know, um, the pri private label securities and the portfolio loans. So we have moratorium availability increase and we have forbearance availability increase. Um, so that was the White House announcement. And then um, as always happens, um, when there's a White House announcement like that, the individual agencies um, proceed and kind of put the meat on the bones. Um, and I'm going to cover FHA because FHA was maybe the most complicated uh, beat on the bones uh, in the aftermath of the White House announcement. That was all done through a mortgagee letter. And again, those mortgagee letters are statements from FHA, presumably to mortgage servicers, but to everyone really saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's our, here are the rules of the game for helping people out. So here's the other, so extended to September 30th, that is a takeaway. I'm gonna tell you the other interesting and, and I think problematic takeaway is that FHA said, if you start forbearance after June 30th, start forbearance after June 30th, before September 30th, you only get six months of forbearance. So this is, I think, a, a big change. They did not say why. Uh, they also adjusted, they have a chart in a mortgagee letter 2115, uh, which says like, you know, maybe they gave you some extra forbearance, um, some of the extra extended forbearance. There's this chart that, that, that states out the policy. And I would look to that if you're, if you, for now, if you're looking to um, figure out how much forbearance folks can have. But FHA said six months. Um, that is not, well, of course, we have folks in the USDA or VA, VA here. I do not read that six-month limit from the USDA or VA, and it does not exist in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I do not know why FHA went out alone, uh, well, seemingly alone, to say six months of forbearance here. Uh, so we wrote a sign-on letter at NCLC, got 30 organizations to turn it around in a day. Thank you, NHRC, and, and some others on, on the call, I'm sure, and said, look, there's, you know, 
we need consistency. There's no reason for FHA to be uh, limiting this to six months instead of 12 months of forbearance. Um, we shall see where that goes. Um, but we made that that point very clear. Uh, so for now, um, you know, I think it's it's important to understand that for your clients because for now we there is that limit of six months of forbearance. Uh, hopefully, um, I hope that they make an adjustment and, and put it to the full 12. Um, and, but we're gonna have to wait on that. The other thing that happened in the mortgagee letter, and this is just confusing. And um, as someone who spends a lot of time working on FHA insured loans, uh, I, I read these things really carefully and I will tell you, I am not sure how it fits in, but I will do my best to share. They released a new modification program for FHA insured loans with COVID hardship. It is called the ALM. It does not, I believe, what do we know about it? Well, it, I do not believe that it replaces the current waterfall of options for FHA insured loans. I, my best read of it is that it sort of sits to the side and that it is really supposed to be essentially an automatic offer if the person qualifies for it. Um, what the what it does is it reduces it hits a payment reduction target so i think i have to, i always kind of get the the numbers messed up i think it's 25 25 percent reduction in piti i've got to go back and look <laughs> i just thought i didn't write that down um but anyway it reduce if, if if the borrower can reduce a to a targeted payment reduction not based on income but a reduction of the monthly payment by doing three things, extending the term to 360 months, putting the loan at an interest rate that is the primary mortgage market survey even. So normally it's private mortgage market survey plus 25 basis points. Here it is even, PMMS flat, and then capitalizing the arrears. If you can achieve that, a payment reduction with that modification, it's the servicer supposed to send it out. Um, what that means for people who are already in process, uh, honestly, not, not sure. I think um, if this would be beneficial for your clients, you should ask for it. You should look at Mortgage e Letter 2021-15. We haven't, um, it just came out, so I haven't done a, uh, a full written analysis of it yet. That, that, that's coming uh, hopefully soon. Um, but you know how it's going to be rolled out is is a real question to me um i'd say if you already think that your client needs a modification um this is not that different than some of the other modification options there uh for your borrowers um, maybe it's going to be a little more of an interest rate reduction if they're sitting in the middle of that covid waterfall um, but I believe it's going to be somewhat automatic in that your client may be getting unsolicited modification offers sent. So I think that 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 this two things that this pay, that this um, modification uh, result is supposed to result in a payment reduction. Um, I think is important um, that it sort of sits to the side of the current waterfall is important. And then other thing that's important, I think, is that your client may be just getting these unsolicited, which I think most of us are used to in uh, the flex mod world with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but we're not really used to on FHF or an FHA. Um, so your client may actually get an unsolicited modification offer in FHA. Uh, this is supposed to come into effect uh, August 24th. Now here's the other thing. <laughs> there are probably more changes coming soon for FHA. So maybe the global uh, takeaway here is um, just wait, watch, watch to see what goes on. Pay attention to your email and these announcements from FHA because I don't think we're done yet. Um, and this may just be uh, in the middle somewhere. So um, I always like to have a little more clarity for folks. Uh, but you know, I can only uh, deal uh, tell you with the hand I'm dealt. 
So this ALM is coming. Honestly, if you see, um, my email is usually somewhere in these slides. If you see a, a modification to ALM, especially one that uh, troubles you, uh, let me know. I'm, I'm very curious to see how this is going to be rolled out, uh, especially um, how it's going to be rolled out for people who are already in the middle of their conversations with the servicer. Um, that, that's, what I've, that's what I've got for you right now. So uh, I, I will say, you know, uh, last thing I'll say is that a modification that results in a, a decent reduction of payment for borrowers is a good thing. And I really hope that um, this program has some potential to uh, help some folks uh, get some payment reduction. And uh, the question is going to be how it's rolled out. And um, we're, 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 we're too early to, to know that yet. Um, so that's FHA. Um, only the six months with a response from the consumer uh, community that it should be 12 and then this ALM. Um, from FA, the last thing I'll talk about is FHFA, so Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I, and I think it's pretty uh, good news uh, coming out of them. Um, biggest news, maybe the, the, the number one with a bullet takeaway from uh, my conversation is, or today is that they have made a helpful change in the flex bond waterfall for people with COVID hardships. Oh, let me say, I've sent all these links to Ellie. A lot of these are pretty easy to find anyway, but uh, hopefully Ellie will circulate them out, especially the COVID uh, waterfall change, which is really great um, in that they are uh, last week, made a policy update to allow interest rate reductions for folks who were not previously going to get interest rate reductions. So under the previous rules for a flex mod, as many of you probably know, and as many of you are probably very frustrated with, if the borrower had equity, 20% equity in the property or more equity than that, when they, uh, and they, and they needed a modification, not only were they shut out from forbearance, uh, and this is a principal forbearance, not forbearing payments, this is putting payments at the end. So not only were those folks shut out from uh, putting payments and modifications at the end of their loan or, or a chunk of their, of their uh, interest bearing principal, they were also prevented from getting interest rate reductions. This was a decision made in the previous financial crisis, people were underwater, and it was uh, really a limit for folks on equity with equity uh, and what they could um, what they could get. The problem with that was so many people coming into this crisis and, and an increasing number of people had equity in their property that they were shutting out from interest rate reductions and modifications a wide wide swath of folks, and especially harmful for folks who already had a flex mod, so already had a term extension to 480 months but then needed something, of course, in the pandemic because it was probably not planned for and really had the tools limited uh, in what they could achieve through a modification. Because if you kind of took away 480 months off the table or you're already near that, um, the, another way to reduce payments would be for an interest rate reduction. But people with equity were prevented from those reductions. So the new policy starting, I, I do not know what the effective date is, but it's in the policy. Uh, the new policy from uh, FHFA is that they are taking away the um, the limits on uh, interest rate reductions for people with equity so that it should go to the market rate regardless of your uh, equity status. Um, now, this is brand new. Who knows how it's going to work? We still have to read everything very closely and think about how it works operationally. So please keep uh, an eye out for how this is working in your own area. Uh, but this is a big, this is hopefully going to be a big change. And I think most importantly, for those of you who were previously dealing with people who were declined flex mods, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac borrowers who were told no, and they were probably told no, maybe because they'd reached the max number of flex mods, more likely because a flex mod was not going to re result in a reduction of payment. This interest rate policy may be pulling some of those borrowers back into eligibility because then you may have another tool to reduce payments, which is the key eligibility requirement for FlexMod. So a change saying, hey, we're going to open up interest rate reductions to more people 
should hopefully pull some people into eligibility from FlexMod who were previously declined. I, I think that is uh, number one. Uh, and so please think about that. Think about clients. Think about who you've got uh, because it should help people and it should also save folks money uh, who are going to be uh, getting, who may be already eligible for FlexMod, but now um, reduced um, interest rates are, are, are coming for folks with equity. So it's great change from FHFA. This was another one that was directly in response to letters that uh, consumer, uh, we, we, we wrote a letter, had a lot of folks sign on, uh, had some people from industry sign on. So it was a good um, industry consumer uh, working together and uh, they made a great change. So the last thing for me before we turn it over is another change from FHFA or not change, but a policy statement saying, um, and this is a good transition to think about with the CFPB, saying um, essentially uh, we expect our servicers to follow the CFPB rule starting July 31st, even though the CFPB rule does not go into effect on August 31st. So essentially closing the gap between the moratorium which, uh, uh, on foreclosures, which, uh, which ends July 31st, and the effective date of the CFPB rule, which I will talk about uh, of August 31st. I, I hope everyone follows suit on that um, because I think it's a really good change uh, and a helpful way to close the gap between the uh, end of the moratorium, at least for the uh, government back, government insured uh, to the um, to the beginning of the CFPB rule. So we will let the CFPB talk about their rule. Uh, VA USDA can talk about their policy. Some good things coming out of both agencies. Um, Ellie, that's all I've got. Um, and, but if, if folks have questions, or if you want to just pass it on, that works for me. Uh, there, there are several questions, but there are um, there's one question in particular that I want to okay. uh, go ahead and ask you now. <laughs> sure. um, somebody asked, what was the third qualification again for the new FHA mod? Okay, so you the mod you qualify for the modification. Oh, um, you qualify for the modification if if the ALM can reduce your payment uh, to a particular uh, from a from where you are, drop a reduction in your monthly payment. I believe 25% reduction in your PITI. And go look at the mortgagee letter for that. The way you do that is by, it's a cookie cutter modification. It capitalizes the interest of the arrears. I think that was the third one. Capitalizes the arrears, sets the term to 360 months, and then sets the interest rate at the Freddie Mac primary mortgage, primary mortgage market survey rate, which is uh, quite low relatively speaking as, as as we have been I, I didn't look it up but i think it's in the threes right now okay and i just want to comment that somebody did put into the chat that they have a client who got this modification and it was oh, really okay. simple and they they Good. they uh they're happy with it and they got a lower payment well that's so, great i i hope i mean it 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 could be a great program the question is um the question really is um how it's going to be operationalized and 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 whether uh, it's going to roll out smoothly. I'm glad to hear that someone got it. And yeah, I just looked up the primary mortgage market survey. It's right around three, uh, right around three percent right now. So that is, you know, an excellent um, interest rate for folks. I mean, that's going to be a big, um, a big reduction uh, for folks. Oh, and then one last thing: the reduction is 25% in the principal and interest not the PITI. Sometimes I get those confused. So we're looking for a 25% reduction in the principal and interest portion of the payment. Okay. Great. There's uh, more questions, but we'll get to them. We'll, we'll go to them and, at the uh, end. Yeah. And always here to, uh, you can always uh, contact me offline if, if we don't get to everything. So thanks, Ellie. Thanks, everyone. We'll pass it on. Great. So with that, we will uh, we'll move on to um, USDA. Uh, we have um, I'm I'm really pleased to say that we have Kathy Glover, the Deputy Administrator for Single Family Housing at USDA. Kathy has over 30 years of affordable housing experience, and I'm so happy that she's willing to be on today to talk with us about uh, what is happening uh, at USDA with COVID-19. Uh, uh, 
uh, assistance for, for homeowners. So Kathy, please take it away. Great. Hey, okay. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you all for this invitation. Happy to be here with you today. Um, Ellie, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, as Ellie mentioned, I am the Deputy Administrator for the Single Family Housing Programs at USDA Rural Development. I oversee all of our programs. Uh, I do have help from uh, an Assistant Deputy Administrator. We have an Executive Director for our Guarantee Program and then the Director of our Direct Loan Program. I want to put, these, uh, put that in so uh, if you get these slides, you know who to contact for assistance. Um, Ellie, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so today, I thought I'd just give a, a, a broad overview of our programs before I get into the COVID, um, the COVID piece of the information today. So um, we have all these programs that you see listed on the screen. Today, I'm mainly going to talk about the 502 Direct Program and the 502 Guarantee Loan Program. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, but these programs, you'll have this uh, just for references to give you an idea of what we're doing, the type of folks that we assist with this program, these programs. I do want to distinguish our guarantee program from our direct loan program. A lot of times we get calls from customers and, and they say they have a USDA loan and they're not sure if it's direct loan or guaranteed loan. A lot of the stuff that you've seen come out from the White House, we are basically, we've been targeting, talking a lot about our guarantee loan program, but we do have this direct loan program as well. Uh, the guarantee program, this is our government uh, backed program, just like the FHA and the VA programs. Another big uh, stickler that we hear a lot in the USDA is what is rural. For us, our program uh, rural is population of 20,000 or less. However, there are some circumstances that we can go up to 35,000, and that applies to both the direct and the guaranteed loan program. And you can see here from the screen, uh, it's 100% financing for both programs. It's just a different um, income limit uh, requirement. We go up to 115% in the guarantee program and 80% um, in our direct loan program. So next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to show you here on this next slide, just real quickly, the demographics so you can see the people that we are serving with these programs and our guaranteed programs. Uh, over 82% of them are first-time homeowners. Um, approximately 18% of them meet one of these uh, uh, ethnicities or race, racial categories. And then the average um, uh, person uh, household composition is a single male earning about $62,000 per year, um, followed by married couples with two dependents earning about $75,000 per year. Next slide, please. On our direct loan program, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is our lower income, lower tiered income, 80% of area meeting or less. And you can see here over 90% of the homeowners are first time homeowners. Uh, approximately 40% of them. Um, so here's their racial and ethnic makeup. And then uh, the most common household is a single female with two dependents earning about $35,000 per year. So that's you know, our universe of people that we're typically working with in this program. And our next slide. Next slide, please. So now I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19, what we, we came to, to hear today. Um, and most of the information, I think you are all probably well aware uh, that we extended the moratorium on foreclosure and eviction. And this applies to both our direct and our guaranteed loan program, even though we don't publicly talk a lot about our direct program, but this uh, applies to our program as well. And in our direct program, we are the servicer for that program. So we're the servicer in terms of our direct loan. Um, the borrowers, as far as the forbearances, um, the forbearance period is still open through September 30th. Uh, if a borrower needs a forbearance for either a direct or a guaranteed loan, they have until April 30th to apply. And I'm going to say it now, and I'll mention it again later. Um, we do have similar options outside of COVID-19. So even though we have these expiration dates here, um, uh, 
for our 502 Direct program, a borrower that's experiencing a hardship, COVID or non-COVID, could apply for a forbearance. In the direct program, we always use the term moratorium. So that is available to our direct loan borrowers at all times. And then on our guaranteed borrowers, we still have forbearance uh, and other types of servicing or loss mitigation options outside of COVID-19. So I just, you know, I just want to make sure a, a takeaway today is that even though we're having these provisions for COVID, we have them without COVID as well. Uh, in most cases, they will have to apply for them. It's not a verbal attestation like it is for COVID, but if a borrower has that severe hardship, there are options for them. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, every, it seemed like everybody got funding under that. We were very happy to get some funding for our 502 direct loan program. Um, and Ellie, if you can go to the next slide. For the 502 direct loan program under the American Rescue Plan, we got a program that we've never had before for our direct loan borrowers, and that is a refinance program. So it is a three-year program, and it would be applicable initially, and I'm saying initially because we got a lot of money, and I don't know, you know if we're going to be able to use it all within the three-year period. So what we're doing, um, there were about 21,502 direct borrowers that were on a COVID-19 forbearance. So we're targeting that population to see if they want to refinance their loan. If we don't offer them a refinance, or if they don't refinance, their only other option to bring their account current, of course, besides making a lump sum payment, and, and we all know that's probably not realistic, because we're talking about borrowers that earn less than $35,000 per year. So the only other option besides a lump sum payment would be um, a reamortization of their loan. And when we reamortize their loan, we reamortize it within the remaining term and at the initial interest rate. So if their interest rate is 7% and they only have 10 years left, left on their loan, that's what is REAM, and that typically creates a much higher payment um, that some of them can't afford. But I am happy to say about 85% of the borrowers that take advantage of a reamortization do become successful. They do not go back into delinquency status. They are able to make those payments uh, and, and start back. And it typically applies when they've been on a moratorium, the regular moratorium, the, you know, before the COVID. Um, so, but now we have this great opportunity to allow them to refinance their loan, and they'll be able to get the lesser of whatever their interest rate is today, uh, whatever their current rate is, or today's interest rate. Today, the interest rate for our program, is, for our direct loan program, is 2.5%. Um, so we're happy to have this. We put out some instructions around it. We, we, it's probably not perfect, but um, it's our first stab at uh, giving these folks an opportunity to start over with a, re with a brand new loan um, at a lower interest rate. And they have the option of extending the terms out uh, as opposed to staying within the remaining terms of the original loan. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you the impact of COVID in our single family programs. As I mentioned uh, on the prior slide, we had about 21,502 direct loan borrowers that are on a COVID, uh, but uh, in our guaranteed program, we had up to 113,000 borrowers that were on a forbearance. Right now in our direct program, there is less than 6,000 on the forbearance, and in the guaranteed program, it's about 40,000. So they are coming off, and not very many are going back on or uh, are, are coming in, but again, that period is still open. So we just wanted to show where they are in terms of the state, so you can see, um, you know, over here where they're, they're heavily populated, but uh, a lot of them in, in kind of in the south. And so that's where uh, the forbearances are. I just wanted to show you that. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so steps for impacted borrowers. I'm sure that you all are well aware of steps one and two. 
letting the borrowers know how to find out who's servicing their loans. Um, but we also want to put a reminder out there about the Housing Assistance Fund. We worked with Treasury, the government agencies, USDA, VA, HUD. We wanted to make sure that they made allowances for our program, for our borrowers. Uh, oftentimes when there's additional funding, folks think, oh, they have a government loan, they, they can't get this money. That is not the case. Uh, if you went through uh, the Housing Assistance Fund, which Treasury put out, you will see that they specifically mentioned our program. Um, we have briefed the National Council of State Housing Agency on our programs, letting them know how to contact us. We have not heard from very many states as they're developing their plan, and we heard from Mississippi, uh, but not many states have contacted us about what they're putting in their plan to see how it will die with our program. But um, we are hoping that our borrowers can take advantage of this housing assistance fund and be able to help them bring their accounts current. Uh, as far as contact for our program, as you all know, the guaranteed lenders are the servicer for these guaranteed loans, and um, they should contact their lender. They can also reach out to us if they have questions, but kind of general overall questions, we try to keep our website updated uh, with information that will be helpful to them, but it's going to be best for them to reach their servicing lender. On our direct loan side, um, on the direct side, not only do we originate these loans through our state and, and local offices, we also service these loans. Our customer service center is located in St. Louis, and uh, we have the contact information here on the screen and, and their hours of operations. Um, so they are servicing um, the direct, uh, our single family direct loans. Uh, next slide, please. And then as far as, Upcoming, what's next? Uh, what are we going to do? Um, um, as Steve mentioned, the mortgage foreclosure and evictions will expire at the end of this month. Um, you talked a little bit about that gap. Uh, I believe that you said FHA or FHFA, or it was offering. We um, we plan to work that into some policy as well to make sure there are no foreclosures before the CFTB rule goes into effect on, in August. Um, so we'll be doing something similar. We'll be releasing something on that um, in the coming week or so. It's not final. We got to run it all through the clearance. So I can't say a whole lot about what we're going to do, but we're going to try and um, put out some policy uh, that will help these borrowers that have been impacted by COVID. Um, September 30th, they can no longer enter COVID-related forbearance, but as I said earlier, there are other options. Uh, we do have the moratorium, again, for the 502 Direct program. The moratorium, it's, um, it's, just, it's, it's a forbearance, and it can be for up to two years. Uh, we do monitor the forbearance the, uh, on the direct side every six months to see if, they're still, if they still need it. Um, then they can continue on, but it is up to 24 months on the direct side, and there are various options on the guaranteed side. Um, the loss mitigation waterfall that we have in our guaranteed program, we are just, there are a lot of options uh, in the guaranteed program, so what we're doing is we'll be releasing this, it'll come out, is we're going to um, kind of make them all available like you kind of go through the check to see you know you may need to do, you may need multiple options to get the borrower to assess if their income has changed um, they're making less money than they were making before they can't afford their pre-covid payment uh, we do we are targeting um, payment reductions for them and so the, we have a lot of options but right now some of them only apply to disaster some of them are regular so what we're doing is going through that and just taking the best of it and kind of checking down the list instead of offering them one thing you may offer them two or three but again uh, not finalized but um, we hope to have that out by the end of this month uh, for sure so if nothing else I just want to make sure everybody understands even um, even though the COVID-19 um, um, disaster designation and how long that's going to be effective, I think it's probably still up in the air. There are other options for both our direct loan borrowers and our guaranteed loan borrowers. And um, we are committed to 
helping these borrowers and finding ways to help them stay in their home. And as a bonus, if we can find a way to get their payments reduced, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, and I believe, Ellie, that is my last slide. Um, so uh, that's just real quick and dirty from USDA. So Ellie, I'll, I'll um, turn it back over to you. Great, thanks, Kathy. There, there are several questions that um, I want to remind everybody that we have scheduled this uh, webinar to, to last until three o'clock, anticipating that there would be a lot of questions. Uh, so just so stay tuned because we will get to all of your questions. But I did want to ask a couple of questions that came up from a few different people in a couple of different ways. But basically the question is, how does somebody find out if they have a USDA loan and how do they determine whether it's direct or guaranteed? Yeah, yeah, that is really <laughs> the million dollar question. Um, so <laughs> if they have a USDA you know, help people understand that. But if they have a direct loan, they are making their payments directly to USDA Rural Housing Service. Uh, that's 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 a key for a person right there. They're making that check or that pad pre-authorized debit. It's going directly to USDA Rural Housing Service. If it is a guaranteed loan that mortgage payment is going to their servicer, their lender. It is not coming to USDA. Um, that's 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 the best best distinction. We put the link in here to so they can click to see who their servicer is. It's on one of the slides uh, in this presentation, so they can of course follow that route and uh, determine who the servicer is for their loan. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And with that, we'll move to our next speaker. Andy Trevane is the Assistant Director for Loan and Property Management at the uh, Veterans Administration. And he has graciously agreed to talk with us today about uh, what is available for people with Veterans Administration loans when they're trying to avoid foreclosure. And again, I really uh, appreciate uh, all of our presenters taking time and um, and, and being here today to, to, to talk about these important things. So Andy, please take it away. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate the time that you've made available for me to talk about our veterans and the options that they have to bring the, or keep their homes. So on the screen here, you can see a couple of things that I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. We have some traditional options like repayment plans, special forbearance, and loan modifications. Those are our typical options that are available anytime to help our veterans retain home ownership. Uh, based on some of the conversation I just heard, thank you, Kathy, I did want to point out that as far as our loan modification goes and our regulation, we are allowed to uh, extend loans back out to 360 months once they've been modified. This is capped by a little sentence in our regulation that says as long, as long as the loan does not exceed a total of 480 months. An example of that would be that you have a loan that's, that's been active for 10 years. You can extend that loan back out to 360 months but a loan that has been active for 10 years and one month, you cannot extend back out to 360 months because it would exceed the 480 month limit. So in essence, uh, VA already allows a 40 year loan modification. We just don't allow it all at one time. Some of our other options that I'm sure everyone is familiar with are our alternatives to foreclosure, which include private sale, short sales, and deeds in lieu. Of course, we prefer that uh, our veterans are able to retain home, home ownership, and we appreciate uh, the efforts that you make to try to keep them in their homes. But if the option is not there, they don't have the financial uh, ability to retain home ownership, please 
point them in a direction that is less detrimental to their financial status. As a part of our loss mitigation options, we do have more than 130 loan technicians that are available to assist our veteran borrowers and you with working out options to try to keep them in their home with the servicer. If you are working with one of our veterans and you want to get information out of the VA and you call one of these 130 plus uh, lung technicians, you're going to need permission from your borrower. That will come in the form of a POA or if you, can, if you have a three-way call that the veteran gives direct authorization to share information with you so you may work with our technician. How does a veteran know who their technician is? Every loan that reaches at least 61 days delinquent or behind is assigned one of our technicians. There will be letters that go out to our veteran borrowers identifying their assigned loan technician. When a veteran contacts the VA or contacts you, they should have that information because when you call into the VA, you will be directed to that particular loan technician who was assigned that loan. Our goal there is that, you know, our veterans are talking to the same person all the time or as much as possible. Obviously, people have days off, but we like to keep some consistency and help uh, generate better relationships with our borrowers by assigning a specific loan technician. And you should be able to, you should always contact that same technician as well if you are assisting the same veteran. There is no geographic assignment for the loan technicians. I know everyone should realize that we have eight locations. We no longer assign loans based upon geographic loan location. So if you have four borrowers you're assisting in Georgia, you could be talking to someone in Virginia, Florida, Texas, Colorado. They could all be assigned those loans. There is no rhyme or reason to it. It is based upon when the loan is, goes delinquent as to how it is assigned to the technician. So just picture it as a round robin. The next person up gets the next loan no matter where it comes from. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, please. When we started addressing uh, the pandemic, we made a couple of adjustments. Uh, I know that you're looking at the partial claim payment program on your screen, but we also made our disaster modifications available to anyone that has been impacted by the pandemic. The disaster modifications uh, have been used quite a bit. The favorite to this point is the disaster extend modification. All it does and it looks a lot like a partial claim to a borrower is take the missed payments and place them at the end of the loan. Just extend the term so the borrower can go ahead and resume those regular monthly mortgage payments without having an, uh, an increased payment that you would get with a repayment plan and some loan modifications. The next thing we did is create a deferment program. And you have to understand our deferment program is different than the GSE's deferment. VA does not have a funding source to reimburse servicers for the amount that is deferred. But for those servicers that have the liquidity and choose to defer the past due payments, we allow that to happen. We did not allow that in the past. The loan is not modified. It is the same as a partial claim in terms of how 
the borrower must repay and what the borrower must repay. The past due payments are deferred. There is no interest. The, the deferment may last and the life of the loan. So if the borrower refinances, sells the property or pays the loan in full, that amount that was deferred is due at that time. It does not prevent them from paying on a schedule or paying off over time or paying off in a lump sum. You, the borrowers may use whatever means of reimbursement of that deferment best fits their financial abilities. The big thing that we did is create the VA partial claim payment program. And you heard me say that we had no funding source to reimburse for a deferment program. How we got around that with our partial claim payment program is everyone I hope has heard of what has been termed a VA refund. A VA refund is when the VA essentially purchases a loan from a servicer for extraordinary circumstances. We take an assignment from that servicer, we bring it into our owned portfolio, and we modify the loan to terms that the borrower can meet, and then we give it to our contractor and they begin servicing that refunded loan. We took that authority for the refund to purchase part of the loan and bring that in and establish a second lien, which then would be given to our contractor to manage that second lien. So what happens if a borrower misses 12 payments? We use our refunding authority to purchase those 12 payments and establish a second lien, thereby the borrower can resume regular monthly mortgage payments. And then the same rules apply as would to the deferment, 0% interest. They have a life of the loan to repay the amount that we purchased as part of the partial claim. Uh, we have some other general rules that you can see here on the page, such as, you know, the loan must have been current or within 30 days of current on March 1, 2020. Uh, they must have been placed on a COVID forbearance. And they must be at least, you know, one payment behind which seems kind of silly because that was always my favorite rule. You must be at least one payment behind because you have to be behind to take advantage of this payment program anyway. We also incorporated, which we haven't generally incorporated in our, in our other loss mint options, that if you are taking advantage of the partial claim payment, you must occupy the property. One of the major differences from other VA options is that borrowers are going to be able to call up and say that they can, they recover from their hardship and they can resume their monthly payments and not really provide any financial information. This came out in a rule this past year. If anybody read the original rule, it was much different than what we're looking at on the screen right now. And we did our best to match what USDA and FHA offers so we could be as similar as possible and give our veterans the same benefits borrowers that go with USDA and FHA get. Now, we, as you probably heard or should have listened in to Steve say that, I think he specifically mentioned that FHA is not done yet. VA is not done yet either. We are working on additional options. This option in particular should be in effect on July 27th. 
but we may have more options to provide our borrowers with payment relief, which the partial claim does not do. The partial claim as is in our rule may not be combined with any other loss mitigation or home retention options. Right now it is basically a standalone partial claim option. What we are working on and what I will hint towards, but are, these things are not available now, are ways in which this same function may be combined with other loss mitigation options and VA's waterfall that may provide payment relief, but those will not be effective until those policies are released by us. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if you are looking for contact information, you can always go to our website. There is links to uh, borrowers having trouble making payments. There are FAQs for our partial claim. And there are other general uh, facts about uh, the pandemic and how it impacts our borrowers and their VA guaranteed loans. Uh, just to reiterate, which you've heard twice now, VA also extended the moratoriums out to July 31st. And we also extended the option to request forbearance after June 30th. And for your benefits, Steve, if you're still listening, the circular does not specify that the forbearance period is six months or 12 months. So I heard what you said, and I will address that with uh, my counterparts once we finish with this call. So maybe we can be a little more specific. And with that, Ellie, I do believe that I am covered with our slides. And if there are any pressing questions, please go ahead. Yeah, there are a couple of questions specifically related to the partial claim, so I will ask you those right now. Um, one person wants to know if you could uh, talk about what documentation is needed for the VA partial claim, and then another person would like you to repeat under what circumstances someone would be eligible for a payment deferral and how it differs from a partial claim. There are no documents required from the borrower for a partial claim. Affirmation, assertion, verification verbally that that borrower may, is able to resume regular monthly mortgage payments is what we are going to require. The deferment, it is participatory or optional for a mortgage servicer. For mortgage servicers that have the ability and the desire to defer payments for their borrowers, they are approved to do so. They are not required to do so. The reason we do not require them to do so is because we don't have a funding source to reimburse them for the amounts that they defer. They are taking all the risk but we were requested early on during the pandemic to make an option available for those mortgage services that have the liquidity to take that type of action to allow it to happen. So we have cleared that through uh, Jenny May. We have cleared that through our own organization and it is optional only. It is not required but all borrowers may request it. Uh, some servicers will and some servicers will not complete a deferment. And as far as the deferment goes, that disaster extend modification will look exactly the same as the deferment with the payments being moved to the end of the loan and allowing that borrower 
borrower to go ahead and resume regular monthly mortgage payments. All right, well, thank you so much, Andy. And we are gonna go ahead and move on to the next speaker. So our next speaker hi is, hi, our next speaker is Beth Spring. She is the Mortgage Servicing Program Manager in the Office of Research, Markets, and Regulations at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And another speaker that we are so happy is willing to take the time to talk with us today. This is a really um, important role with some pretty significant changes that will impact the uh, homeowners that you all are working with. So Beth, please take it away. Thanks so much, Ellie. And Ellie, I'm going to start on the slide after our disclaimer. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry you can't see me, but as Ellie mentioned, I'm in the Office of Research, Markets, and Regulations. I am joined by a few colleagues today from our Public Engagement Office. I'm going to provide a high-level overview of the final rule, which we issued June 28, that amends the Bureau's mortgage servicing rules in light of the COVID-19 emergency. We issued the MPRM in April and we finalized the rule in June, so it could be effective August 31st because we realized that there are so many borrowers that are going to be exiting forbearance this fall. The final rule really aims to provide relief for mortgage borrowers facing financial hardship due to the pandemic. We know that there are borrowers who remain seriously delinquent and will be at risk at foreclosure initiation this fall. Uh, Black Knight estimates there could be as many as 900,000 borrowers exiting forbearance by the end of the year. And this final rule really will help to ensure that there's a smooth and orderly transition as other state and federal moratoria end. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the provisions in the final rule. There really are four main components. All of the final rule amendments are temporary, either because they include specific sunset dates or because they're linked to programs made available to borrowers with COVID-related hardships. They also only apply to borrowers' principal residents. So the main four provisions in the final rule are one, a temporary special COVID-19 procedural safeguard, an exception making it easier for servicers to offer certain streamlined loan modifications, expanded early intervention messages, and timing requirements for reasonable diligence contact servicers must make at the end of forbearance. Okay, next slide. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what is the corner store, cornerstone in the rule, the temporary special COVID-19 procedural safeguards. This amendment helps ensure that borrowers have a meaningful opportunity to be reviewed for loss mitigation options before foreclosure referral through the end of this year. It only applies to certain mortgages, which I'll discuss a little bit more shortly. So under the final rule, until December 31st, a servicer must ensure that one of three procedural safeguards is met before the servicer can make the first notice or filing required for foreclosure. The servicer may proceed with uh, the first notice or filing before the end of the year if any one of the three safeguards is met. We had proposed something slightly different. We, we had proposed a pre-foreclosure review period, which would have applied to all loans, but we decided based on comments to narrow the scope of the procedural safeguard. So first, the safeguard, uh, the first safeguard is a complete loss mitigation review. And so generally this means that if a borrower submitted a complete loss mitigation application, the servicer must have reviewed the complete loss mitigation application and gone through all of the notifications and procedures required by our existing mortgage servicing rules. And if the servicers determine that the borrower is not eligible for any loss mit options or the borrower has rejected all offered loss mitigation options, or let's say the borrower has failed to perform on a loss mitigation option such, such as failing their trial period plan. So in this situation, the servicer may proceed with the first notice or filing because 
the Bureau's perspective is the borrower or nor the servicer would benefit from any delay in this instance. And the second safeguard is that the property securing the mortgage loan is abandoned under state or local law. We got a lot of comments and feedback back on that provision. So if the property has been determined to be abandoned, the servicer may proceed with the first notice or filing for foreclosure. And the third, the third safeguard is that the servicer must have conducted specific outreach during the 90-day period um, before the first notice they're filing and the borrower is unresponsive or didn't otherwise communicate with the servicer during that period. And if the borrower was in a forbearance program, the servicer must not make the first notice or filing until 30 days after that forbearance ends. If the borrower is unresponsive and the servicer conducts this outreach required and the borrower remains unresponsive and they wait that 30 days, then they can proceed with the first notice or filing. I did want to note for this group that a borrower is not considered unresponsive if the servicer is actively working um, with the borrower's housing counselor. So as Steve and a few others have mentioned, the Bureau is not sure what the other government agencies are going to do in terms of their foreclosure moratoria. Most, as of now, are ending July 31st, with the exception, as Steve pointed out, of FHFA. It sounds like USDA Rural may be coming out with something shortly, but we get a lot of questions about this 30-day gap or this donut hole between the end of the federal moratoria and the effective date of the final rule. And, you know, absent any of the other government agencies taking any action, the Bureau, based on its market outreach, doesn't expect servicers are going to push through with many foreclosures or filings in that 30-day period because of the investor requirements that are in place currently to review these borrowers for loss mitigation. So fairly confident by the time it takes to solicit the, borrow the borrowers for deferrals and partial claims, you know, within that window, by the time they get to those solicitations, the rule will be effect. So as I mentioned, the special COVID-19 procedural safeguards generally apply only to certain loans. And they apply if the borrower's mortgage loan obligation became more than 120 days delinquent on or after March 1st, 2020. And then two, the statute of limitations applicable to the foreclosure action being taken expires on or after January 1st of 2020. So in other words, the procedural safeguards are not applicable for borrowers who had serious delinquencies prior to the pandemic or if relevant statutes of limitations will expire um, by the end of this year. And this final rule provisions will ex provision will expire January of 2022. Okay, next slide, Ellie. Okay, the second primary amendment in the final rule, which makes it easier for servicers to offer borrowers certain streamlined loan modifications, so generally, the Bureau's existing mortgage servicing rules prohibit a servicer from offering a borrower loss mitigation option based on the evaluation of an incomplete application. So the final rule essentially creates a new exception to that requirement that permits servicers to offer certain streamlined loan modifications um, to, uh, to borrowers um, with COVID-19 hardship based on the evaluation of an incomplete loss mitigation application. So this flexibility can really allow servicers to get borrowers into an affordable mortgage payment faster with less paperwork uh, for both the borrower and for the servicer. So eligible loan modifications must uh, satisfy certain criteria that aim to establish sufficient protections to help ensure that these borrowers aren't harmed if the borrower is choosing to accept an offer um, based on an incomplete evaluation. So for example, uh, to be eligible, the loan modification may not cause the borrower's uh, monthly required principal and interest payment to increase, and the servicer can't charge any fee in connection with the loan modification. Another example would be the servicer must waive all existing late charges, penalties, got payment fees, similar charges that were incurred after March 1st of 2020 if the borrower accepts the loan modification offer. So as I mentioned, there are four main amendments. The next 
who are really about live contact early intervention requirements and the amendment to the loss mitigation reasonable diligence obligations. So both sets of changes are meant to ensure services are communicating one timely with borrowers and that they're providing accurate information about borrowers' loss mitigation options uh, during the pandemic. And next slide. So the third amendment is the third amendment is the early intervention and early intervention obligations. So the final rule requires servicers to discuss specific additional COVID-19 related information during the live contact with delinquent borrowers. Um, and some of these are already required under our existing rules, but the final rule really expands the messaging that servicers must convey to delinquent borrowers if the service, if the servicer is establishing live contact with a borrower in two circumstances. And one that would be the borrower is delinquent, but not yet in forbearance. And I know everybody is trying to get to that population and get in contact with those borrowers. And then two, if the borrower is nearing the end of their COVID-19 related hardship forbearance. So in those two circumstances, the final rule requires that servicers share certain information with borrowers about their options and information. Um, and for example, how to find contact information for HUD approved housing counselors. So this provision is temporary and this provision will end October 1st of 2020. And then finally, the last key amendment adopted in the final rule clarifies servicers' reasonable diligence obligations to try to complete a loss mitigation application from the borrower when the borrower is in a COVID-19 related hardship um, forbearance program. And this would be when it was offered available to the borrower based on the evaluation of the incomplete application. So the rule specifies that a servicer must contact the borrower no later than 30 days before the end of the forbearance period if that borrower is remains delinquent at the end of the forbearance period to determine whether or not the borrower wants to proceed with um, a loss mitigation application and to try to get that application um, complete. So those are really the four. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just I wanted to just uh, pipe in just for a second. You mentioned that the requirement about the notification for contact information and uh, that it only applied until October 1st, 2020. Your PowerPoint says October 1st, 2022. 2022 is the correct date. Sorry if I misspoke. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned previously, the rule takes effect August 31st of 2021. And next slide, Ellie. I just wanted to plug a couple additional items. First would be the bureaus worked really hard to get resources available in a central location to homeowners and renters on our Housing Hub website. And so we will be doing a big push um, with some trade organizations to get all of the resources out um, to their members to include resources for limited English proficiency borrowers, um, help for homeowners and rental assistance. Next slide, please. We also lastly, you know, encourage you, um, this group to talk to the housing counselors and if housing counselors are running into issues with servicers or encourage borrowers to submit complaints um, using the bureau's complaint forms complaints are have mortgage related complaints have been on the rise and these complaints really help inform us on the problems that are happening in the marketplace and they help us focus our efforts so I apologize that it, the rule is very technical. I tried to make it as entertaining as possible. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to add that there it was a 200 page document. So I doubt anybody has read the whole thing. There were several folks at the Bureau that contributed to the final rule. So if I can't answer a specific question um, that anyone has, you know, I would be more than happy um, to follow up. So with that, 
that it was all that I had. And thanks for having me this afternoon. Great, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna get to the questions now. There are a lot of questions, and I'm gonna just kind of go through them one by one. Oh, here we go. All right, so this is I'm gonna go back to the beginning. So some questions for Steve. Well, one question is is actually for me that I'll I'll answer very quickly. Um, somebody asked how the extension uh, of the that the Treasury put out for the um, homeowner assistance fund, how that is going to impact the the timing of getting the funds out to 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 those in need. And you know, obviously this is an, an unexpected delay that we hope won't continue. Um, you know, the states have to submit their plans, Treasury has to review the plans, and then um, if there is anything that Treasury wants the states to change, they'll have to make those changes. Um, and if not, it, you know, once everything is finally approved, then this, the, the states have to, you know, get their programs up and running. So uh, we hope that this is going to happen as soon as possible and that programs will start to be up and running in the fall. Uh, but there's, it's really difficult to know how, how quickly all this is going to happen. Okay, let's see, on to the first question. Uh, so Steve, you shared um, information about a clarification that you received from HUD in regards to leaving the forbearance early to request a modification. Can you uh, kind of restate that clarification, sure. please? Sure, let me find it. It's FHA info 2128. Ellie, I can send this to you. Yes, please. And what it did, and this was thanks in large part to your work and work from NCLC and especially though from housing counselors and legal aid attorneys who brought this up. There was a question that um, about whether you had to complete your forbearance plan before you could access loss mitigation post forbearance options. Um, this was happening, I think, particularly with FHA insured loans. I do not know why. Um, there was no nothing in the guidance saying that that would happen. And it's particularly a bad idea to force people to finish off forbearance plans uh, if they're ready to exit, uh, because then you're just adding on to the balance due. Um, so housing counselors, legal aid attorneys, raised this issue saying you know why why would you have to be behind three more months when my people are ready and so fha issued this clarification and it was great it just essentially said it is permissible for mortgagees to begin reviewing borrowers for covid 19 options at any point in bold prior to the completion or expiration of their uh, forbearance period um so that was good and um, so it's pretty clear now I have not heard of this, maybe others have, I have not heard of this as being a problem um, in other, uh, under other investor rules. Maybe it was just something about how the FHA rules were read, who knows, but um, that's, the, that's the clarification. And it is FHA info 21-28. These are harder to find. You actually just have to Google that, and then it comes through, but I'll also send it to Ellie. Great. Um, I, I guess this this could be answered by anybody um, who has any kind of information, but this person is wondering what assistance is out there for older homeowners who uh, are not going to be returning to work and are in forbearance. Uh, the current Freddie product of refinancing requires them to come out of forbearance and make three payments, and these. Uh, older homeowners are hit hardest, especially if they happen to lose an income winner during the pandemic. Um, if anybody has it, any thoughts, <laughs> feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll talk across spectrum here. You know, I mean, I think for somebody who has essentially a permanent reduction of, of, of their ability, you're going to be looking at a modification program rather than um, 
just as, as a global matter. It doesn't mean that there aren't some refinance programs, maybe, you know, like they probably, maybe if they're a direct loan borrower, maybe the refinance program that Kathy mentioned would be good. But, you know, but for the most part, someone in that shape is going to need probably a, a, mo a permanent change of their terms and a loan modification. And hopefully, you know, they would have some, it all depends on the situation, of course, and the investor. Uh, hopefully they'd have some income from uh, Social Security or something to make that happen. But I think globally you're exploring a modification option rather than a refinance program. There's always sell, but if they want to stay in their house, you know, you're looking probably at mod. Okay. Um, what about um, a homeowner who is already in foreclosure? And I think that, Steve, this was a question in response to your discussion about the FHA um, modification. So, you know, I have to read the, um, they, I always have to go back and look at what the precise um, mortgagee letter language says, but my understanding is that, um, it, it's um, in one second, because I think it matters a lot here. So, uh, you know, the moratorium um, generally applies to both the initiation and foreclosures and process. Okay, yeah. So if it's an FHA insured loan, um, the mortgagee letter 2021-15s limits right now, they they're not only should not be um, filing, you know, starting foreclosures, but they also shouldn't be moving forward on foreclosures in process. Um, CFPB, I, my understanding of the CFPB rule is that it is not helpful for people who are in process. Of course, um, you know, they can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe that's the case. You know, so, uh, so there's some, some help generally now uh, with a moratorium in place, but you know, at the end of June or July, sorry, uh, some of these moratoria are going to be lifted and, and, and not everyone is going to be helped by the CFPB rule. So I think for folks in that spot, you know, now, now becomes crucial for helping them evaluate their post forbearance options. Now, maybe they can get into forbearance. Maybe they're in forbearance. Um, forbearance options are still available. They might be in forbearance and forbearance. They shouldn't be proceeding with foreclosure. Um, but you know, I think I think that is important to note um, for people already in process, kind of where things stand with the moratorium. I don't know if that's responsive. It's it's, it's hard to know with the particular question, but that's sort of what I'm what I'm leaning. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and then somebody asked with the with the FHA, the new FHA modification, is partial claims still available to put? with that okay that's a great question so th this is just a reminder so the they call it the advanced loan modification the alm does not involve a partial claim which is that which we talked about you know already which is that uh payment by if it's a partial claim from hud hud to catch up or defer part of the the, the amount due on the loan to, in order to either bring it current or to reduce the payment. The ALM does not have a partial claim feature, um, but it also does not replace the waterfall options that do have a partial claim feature. And the question is, how does the, how do they interrelate? And, and you kind of believe, although we're gonna have to see it in practice, say, you know, I'd rather, I. I I believe you can say, you know, I want to opt into the COVID waterfall um, and not do the ALM because maybe I just want to get a partial claim um, and just bring my loan current. Um, but, you know, that you, that that's on, you know, it's going to be hard to say how this all actually works interrelates in practice. Um, but the, the new modification offer that's like i said to the side of the covid waterfall does not involve a partial claim okay 
All right, I believe we are moving to questions for Kathy. Yes, uh, so does the USDA, is the USDA offering modification on the guarantee and direct programs? Yeah, so on the guarantee program, yes, a loan modification is one of the options or it could be combined, you know, with some other options. So yes, we're, we're doing that. On the direct program, we do not have a modification program. So our answer for the modification on the direct side for the, the borrowers that had been in COVID forbearance status is the refinance program that I talked about. And that's the new program. And it's going to be very streamlined. It's not going to be all the documentation that you would normally have to provide with the refinance. Uh, the prerequisite is that you have been on one of these forbearances. Um, and I think the only restriction will be is because these programs have income limitation requirements. We're the only government program that has that. So for the direct program, when I talked about their income cannot exceed 80% of median, the household income, that is, that's going to come into play because we can't provide a loan to someone that see, exceeds the income limit for the program, but all of the other traditional things that we would be looking at, inspections and credit and all of that stuff, will not be a factor. Okay, and I think that you just answered two of the questions that are, that are next. One is for USDA, what happens after uh, forbearance? What are the options for a borrower? And what I just heard you say is the refi option, yes? Correct. Yeah, that is that, that that's one of the options. The other option, if they don't want to go, if they don't want to do the refinance program, the option for the direct loan borrower is to have their loan reamortized. And that's what I talked about earlier, which in the reamortization is reamortizing within the remaining terms of the loan at whatever the interest rate was at, at the time of the loan. So the, that would be the only other option for them. Okay. And, th and that was, and you answered the question about, can USDA direct loan borrowers refi? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Um, all right, so this person says, uh, their uh, HUD approved housing counseling agency also does USDA packaging. Their intermediary asked if they were interested in helping with the refinancing of the USDA loans. Um, the question really is about the the payment for doing that. It um, this person is saying the payment was too low for the amount of work. Can USDA consider utilizing housing counseling agencies to help with the refinancing and pay more for the valuable service? Uh, yep. So I I think I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So the the packaging the fee for the packaging is low. Because it's lower than what it is for the normal packaging program. And the just the reason for that was because you don't have to do all the verifications and all the stuff that we have to do for the regular packaging program because this is so streamlined. Uh, but yes, housing counselors can help with the packaging and uh, we are looking at the fee and we're taking feedback from some of the other organizations from the intermediary to try and assess, you know, is it really that extra work? What we're hearing now, it's, it's, it's mostly kind of busy like phone call. They're getting phone calls about the program. So we, we didn't factor that into it, but yes, we can um, consider that. Great. If a borrower has unusual difficulty reaching their servicer for guaranteed USDA mortgage, what can they do? Um, they can uh, contact us. Um, we have on our website, uh, we, uh, we manage the guarantee program from the national headquarters instead of our 47 state offices in our servicing center like we do on the direct side. They can contact information to reach our office is on our website, so they can contact us and we can help. Um, we can help them with those connections. Okay, so this is a 
this is an interesting question for 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 everyone, um, but it's particularly interesting given the the CFPB rule that goes into effect in August um, around abandoned properties. But this person asks, can the guest speakers discuss options for homeowners who do not occupy the property but are coming out of forbearance? But I, I don't know the details about why the homeowner doesn't occupy the property, uh, but that's just the general question. So any thoughts? Uh, that, um, so go ahead. Is, I was going to say, Scott, if you want to go first, go right ahead. <laughs> I, I just was going to say for the USDA borrowers, that is, in con that is one of the conditions of these options that we have available they must occupy the property. Uh, that That's a condition of our loans at the onset. You know, we don't have like a second home or any of that type of program. So as a condition of USDA loan and the services, you must occupy the property. So I can't remember the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, rules off the bat. That's going to be um, where where some of this is for them. Um, I, I don't think you'd have to go look, but I don't think owner occupancy is required for uh, Fannie and Freddie, so that might cover some second homes. Um, I will tell, I will say that the FHA, for the first time that I'm aware of, did do a non-owner occupant modification program uh, just for COVID hardship. So uh, that's new. Um, because FHA has some of the very similar rules that uh, uh, Kathy mentioned in terms of requirements for owner occupancy, but I guess there's the FHA had some recognition that there might be some people um, with second homes. You know, if it's if they're not occupying because it's abandoned, I think they're in a different boat. You know, that of course is going to come into the uh, CFPB rule um, that we talked about, but um, at least for FHA. Uh, for this, for, for COVID hardships, there is at least a, a mod program for non-owner occupant, presumably people with some rental. So you'd have to look at that. It's in um, Mortgage Letter 2021-05. Okay. It looks like I'm moving into questions about the CFPB mortgage servicing rule. Um, I, I think this was addressed, but I'll ask the question again so that it, the answer can be um, can be said again. Will this rule apply to mortgages not backed by the government? So, so it it does apply to all mortgages, but you have to, as it's come up, you have to be careful of the exceptions that I mentioned. So it doesn't apply to loans that were serious delinquent prior to March 1st of 2020. And a lot of those are going to be held in portfolio and private label. Okay. Um, somebody's asking for the 30-day contact. What counts as contact? A lot of that is spelled out in our existing reg X. We we didn't want to, you know, obviously servicers always want the Bureau to be more prescriptive, but we didn't want to spell out in all the ways. So we're sort of defaulting to what's existing in Reg X, which I believe includes um, notifications, attempts at live contact, all that has to be documented. And then there's requirements for records retention as well. Okay. Um, and the, I, yeah, I think this is similar. Um, somebody's asking um, and directing this to CFPB. Are there any uh, updates on in-house modifications on proprietary loans? Um, um, maybe I, what I'm not quite sure. I understand the question. Um, so, so we don't mandate any specific type of loan modification. We just spell out in the final rule that if in order to meet the requirements, then it has to meet certain criteria, one being that the principal and interest can't increase 
servicers can't charge fees in conjunction with the modification. Just in general, based on what the Bureau has heard that the private sector has modeled or will offer similar type products um, like the payment deferral um, and the load modifications with some, you know, slight nuances. I'm not quite sure if that's answering the the question. Yeah, I think that does a good job of answering the question. Um, and, you know, this is, I will ask this question. I think that um, it's kind of been asked and answered, but I'll one more, one more time ask in a different way, what is available for borrowers that were delinquent before March 1st, 2020? So I think that it depends on each borrower's specific situation. You know, as Steve mentioned, obviously there's there's some state uh, moratoria that will remain in place um, even after the, the federal moratoria. And we get a lot of questions about borrowers that are not in forbearance. And we're looking at the same Black Knight data that the rest of the industry is looking at. We know that that's a significant population of borrowers. We know a lot of those borrowers were delinquent prior to the pandemic. Um, a lot of them are unresponsive. Uh, this sort of ties back to the question about moving forward with foreclosure. And I think I had said we didn't feel that the Bureau, that anybody benefited in that situation. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, but what we continue to hear is that borrowers who are, have been traditionally unresponsive, sometimes that first notice or filing um, can get them, um, the borrower, to re-engage with their servicer. So um, we are certainly hoping that that will happen. Um, but it's really making contact with the borrower, finding out, um, you know, what options are available based on their investor and hoping that we can get those borrowers either into forbearance by the deadlines or getting those borrowers modified, which may be a more significant solution considering their prolonged delinquencies. Great, well, that's all the questions from our attendees. I do have one question um, for all of you, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember which which agency answered this? One agency did mention this, but my question is, if there is somebody who is currently in forbearance and they've used up all of the forbearance time, does the new opportunity to enter forbearance apply to them? Can they get another six months of forbearance? Um, this is Kathy, I guess. For... Go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to let Andy go. Um, <laughs> this is Kathy. So if they've used up the entire, um, I guess, 360 days or, or the year, so the borrowers um, that were in a forbearance prior to June, and that, that's, and I think in everybody's documentation, FHANB, if they were in forbearance prior to June 30th, 2020, they can request uh, an additional forbearance, two additional forbearance, two additional 90 days. So they can get another six months for a, to for a total of 18 months. Um, and then if, if, if that um, didn't apply, they can just try some of the regular servicing options. Like I mentioned earlier, we have these options outside of COVID. And I, I think if people will remember that, um, work with their servicer if it's a guarantee and if it's a direct loan, uh, work with us directly at USDA and we can um, see if they can qualify for moratorium or reduced payments. So, so the, the regular options still exist. And Andy? Uh, pretty much what Kathy said. Um, if you request additional time prior to June 30th, you can receive those two uh additional periods but for requesting up to uh well, september 30th that is initial not in addition to okay great that, that's the that's the question thank you <laughs> 
and then and then Steve, what about with um, with FHA FHFA? So you're not going to get more if you're if you've run out of your time, you're not going to get you know you have to look at when you request to figure out when um, how much time you can get. Uh, for most folks, I actually don't know, but you know, you, you're not going to get, if you've sort of hit your amount of forbearance, um, by the, you know, the, the forbearance limit based on when you asked, I don't know that you're going to get a lot more. And probably at that stage, you're going to want to, you know, uh, look at these post forbearance options. Um, it is, you know, the, the big one for FHA to, to keep in mind is that, um, as it stands now, you only get six months. Uh, Andy, I read VA is saying 12. So just, you know, I think, I think that's the right thing to do. That's what everyone else is doing, except FHA on six, and hopefully that changes. Um, but I, I, I think you have to look at when they request and then compare it to the proper investor guidance. If there's any trouble with that, you can ask me. But um, that's that's the way to do it. Great. Well, that's all the questions, and I'm going to hand it back over to Bruce to close us out. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our guests. Thanks for everybody who stuck through on the higher ed. Still have 120 people on the call. That's great. You know, just a reminder: if you if your organization has not joined NHRC, do it now. Go to our website. You can see what our dues framework is but you're really funding this work and the lobbying work and the things that we can't get others to fund. Um, and it really gives us the flexibility to do some of the things that really defend and, and promote housing counseling. Um, it's been a very good year for us. And I think um, uh, we're seeing an expansion in, in the funding streams. Um, we hope to provide some more over the course of the year. Um, and of course, we still have the, the, the couple um, benefits. One is the, um, uh, discount on the credit reports um, and uh, the second one is the savvy um, a student loan program for those people that use it um, these are all valuable but you know really the reason to join is that you're supporting the work that we do and we appreciate uh, the many groups of you that have and the many groups of you that have renewed I was really pleased with this year um, you know we were worried that groups might be in a strain but um, a lot of you have already renewed and um, a few of you will be getting notices from us this month, and I'm sure we'll get a good response on that too. But thanks so much. Um, we'll, let, we'll look for on the list for when we'll have other leaders' calls coming up. Um, and thanks to the staff for pulling this all together. Bye now. <laughs>